Hello, River Valley Church at Home. It's Dan here, and just want to uh, welcome you to our uh, service today. Uh, Pastor Mark, one of our downtown campus teachers, is going to be sharing on our next value series teaching, Multiply Disciples. And uh, as we've been going through these values, we've, we've wanted to have a lot of time for you to interact with us. And uh, this last week, we talked about serving and about uh, the fact that we're a church that's about service, not serve us. And if you're still, uh, maybe you've had that brochure from last week, or you've been on our church website or app, and you've been really praying through what does it mean to serve, I would really encourage you to take that next step, to email one of the pastors, to, to take a look at maybe things that are, uh, maybe you're not an upfront person, maybe something behind the scenes that you you can be serving with us. So that is coming. We also want to uh, remind you that uh, we have times for you to give, whether it's giving in person, uh, dropping off your giving at the front office, or using our online uh, giving options, the tab on the website or our church app. So uh, with that, we have a couple more announcements. Natalie and Rachel are bringing you the River Valley Weekly. <music> Welcome to the weekly. My name is Rachel. I serve out at the Rogue River campus with my husband Tim. Nat and I have a few announcements for you. Nat, take it away. Thanks, Rach. Hey, if you're new, uh, we would love for you to fill out this Connect card, okay? You can find that in your Connect Center or in the chair back pocket in front of you. Fill this out and drop it off at your Campus Connect Center so that we can meet you. River Valley ladies, there is another women's event coming up and we want you to be there. Yes, you. Bring your mom, bring your grandma, bring your friends, bring your life group ladies. It's gonna be an amazing time. It's going to be on March 12th and it's actually going to be out at the Redwood campus. Check your program for more details, but here's a little sneak preview. There's gonna be worship, a time of fellowship, there's gonna be teaching, and of course, of course, there's gonna be yummy, amazing treats. It's not going to be the same if you're not there. So please, ladies, please, please come. Hey, so last weekend at uh, each location, we uh, gave you opportunities to serve. All right. And we want to continue reminding you that there's many opportunities to serve at River Valley. This weekend, uh, we want to emphasize the opportunity of greeting. Now, we need greeters at all four of our campuses. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love for you to fill out our Connect card, check the serving box and say, I want to be a greeter. Now, if you're interested in greeting, there's two requirements. First requirement, you have to smile. Second requirement, all you got to do is hand someone a program. So if you can smile and hand someone a program, we would love for you to be a greeter with us. So be sure to fill out the Connect card. River Valley, fun fact. We used to have our database called CCB. Not anymore. We are moving into what is called Realm. So there's going to be some new info and new details coming out with our database. Make sure you check your program for details. Hey, that's all the announcements we have for you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week. Oh 
put death in his place His life is flowing through my veins His life is flowing through my veins I believe in you I believe in you You're the God of miracles I believe I'm at the point in my life where I realize that most of my life is in the rearview mirror. And unless I live to be like 115, I'm definitely past uh, the halfway point. Now, I'm okay with that because I'm definitely more of a forward thinker. And I, I like to believe that my best days, you know, are, are still ahead. But it's a time when I look back, I think about now, I think about the future, and I realized my greatest passion, not that I've always been great at it, but my greatest passion and the thing that matters most in my life has been investing and pouring into other leaders uh, especially. You know, people who have become pastors and missionaries and youth pastors and campus pastors and life group leaders or community leaders. And that's just like super exciting to me. I, I have always been passionate about getting people into the game, like getting people off the bench because they have such value and, and skill and something that God has given to them uh, to get them going uh, in their work for the Lord. So, so for me, more important than actually doing 
is getting other people uh, doing. So I remember back in my youth pastor days in Los Angeles, and I was a part of a big church and a big youth ministry, but I'm convinced that the most important thing that happened at that time was investing my life into seven high school guys. And most of those guys to this day are in full-time ministry. Uh, some are famous, like Francis Chan. Believe it or not, I actually, he was an intern of mine, and I worked with him for three years. And uh, just so exciting to see what God can do uh, in raising up others around us to get them into God's work. Uh, the other day, I was at a pastor's meeting here in Grants Pass, and uh, it was at the Gospel Rescue Mission they were hosting. And so a uh, big group of pastors, we like to get together once a month, and, and uh, the mission was sharing their particular strategy and what they're doing in the community. It was very informative and helpful uh, to us. And they introduced a new staff member. And, and, and a very important position there at the mission. And when they introduced this guy, uh, I remembered that I was able to lead him to the Lord in my living room like 20 years ago. And, and he got involved in the church and, and got into a life group and really began to grow. But I'd actually forgotten that, you know. And it's so encouraging, even the things we have forgotten, that God uh, does to get people not only saved uh, by the little things we do in our lives, saved and then to grow in their faith and to become um, servants and volunteers and whatever it is God has uh, for them uh, in, in, in his work. And so I share all that with you uh, because we're in this series called Values. We're talking about the core values of our church. We, we have nine of them and we're on eight today. Next week we'll wrap up. But uh, value number eight says this, multiply disciples. So not just making disciples, but multiplying uh, disciples. We believe that time is short and lives are at stake. Therefore, we are urgently multiplying disciples, workers, groups, and campuses. And again, I don't know that we're doing this awesome, but we're sure trying. We are urgently, why? Because time is short, the clock is ticking, and especially if people don't know Jesus, for them, uh, the, 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 the clock is running out. And uh, so we see this powerful uh, value modeled in Acts chapter 6. I'm going to just quickly walk you through the story here. A little background. The church had just started and it was doing awesome and people were coming to the Lord. And, and, and the church right away encountered some problems. One of the problems they had was there were, there were a group of widows that were uh, being overlooked in getting the food they needed to live. Something to know about that culture and that time frame. There was no safety net or government programs uh, for the elderly or for widows. And so uh, the, the widows, especially Christian widows, relied on uh, the church or their family. And so what was happening is that those Christian widows that were Jewish were getting their needs met in the food, but those, it was actually discriminatory. They, those who weren't Jewish, uh, who were Gentile, were getting overlooked. And uh, so a big problem, and verse 2, the, the apostles, they do something about this problem. It says, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now, the leaders, I'm sure, were tempted to jump in and do the work. It would have been the quickest fix. I'm sure they wanted to because they loved uh, the widows. But they realized they needed to stay true to the priorities, which was the word of God, teaching, and the oversight and leadership of, of the whole church movement. Verse 3 says, so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. So, so notice what they do here. Rather than doing the easy thing, the popular thing, the expected thing, just to do it themselves, they do the humble thing and they ask for help. They actually give the ministry away and they enlist new workers. And it says, uh, everyone liked this idea, verse 5, and they chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, uh, Timon, Parmenas, 
and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So, man, I love this because they're mobilizing disciples. They're getting others into the important work. They could have done it themselves. It was way better to get other people doing the work also. What's the result? Verse 7. So God's message continued to spread, and the number of believers greatly increased. It literally means they multiplied rapidly in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to So when did things start to multiply and rapidly uh, take off? When the apostles gave the ministry away and shared it uh, with others and mobilized the church. You know what's interesting here? All the names we don't read yet. Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, John Mark. They weren't even Christians yet. They're part of this multiplication uh, movement that took place there uh, in the early church. So, multi- so mobilizing disciples and multiplying disciples. This is our story at River Valley. This is our passion. How do we get more people coming along with us? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, like what we see in our church of volunteers and workers uh, out in their everyday lives doing such an awesome work uh, for the Lord and endeavoring for more and more uh, of that. This is simply what Jesus did. We're not doing anything that he, that he didn't. He, he basically poured his life into the 12. It's the most important thing that he did, uh, other than going to that, that cross, is uh, investing in them because then they were used to really bring uh, such change throughout uh, the world. That's why we're here uh, today. Now, another way of looking at this, I love uh, the scripture in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And uh, it says, These things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So one short verse, but I don't know if you noticed there, there's four generations of Christians in that one verse. And so you have first uh, Paul, who's the me there, and The second generation is Timothy, the you. And then the third generation is the reliable people that Timothy is supposed to teach. So it goes from Paul and what he poured into Timothy, and he pours into reliable people. And then four are the others. And so that's more others that are impacted by the reliable people. So four generations of a movement where the church uh, just continues to grow and disciples are um, uh, reproduced and multiplied. Let me give you one more scripture and we'll jump into our application. Uh, 1 John 2, and I'm not going to uh, read it. I'm just going to quickly, for time's sake, just, just share it with you. John gives us uh, three different categories of Christians. Not a hierarchy, but just spiritual growth categories. The children the adolescents, and the parents. And and not age groups, but spiritual children, spiritual adolescents, spiritual parents. And so the spiritual children would be those new in the faith or those who have been Christians a while but just maybe haven't grown for whatever reason. The adolescents are those who, like your teenagers, they devour food. They devour, in this sense, the word of God, and they're growing. They're growing up. And then, of course, the adults, the parents, are those, uh, like all uh, good parents, care for the younger and serve and protect and provide and bring new life into the world and, you know, help the younger become responsible adults. So now when it comes to our River Valley mission, connect, grow, go, those three words attach to the three words here in 1 John 2. So the, the spiritual children, that's connect, connecting to Jesus, born again, uh, a child of God, connecting to a group is growing up in that childhood. Then the adolescence is the grow. That's what adolescents do, right? So growing up in the Lord and in the word. And then the, uh, uh, the parents is the go serve, which of course, that's what uh, parents uh, do. Caring for the younger, leading, reproducing, you know, parent stuff. Okay, so this is our church strategy, 
and it connects right here with this, uh, I guess I call it a process of spiritual growth from childhood, adolescence, and uh, spiritual parenting. This is the, the goal. This is the process that we're on as a church and as individuals. It, it kind of looks like this. Here's a definition of multiply. Make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Because that's what Jesus told us to do, Matthew 28, Great Commission. Go into all the world and make uh, disciples. And, and, and don't stop. Let the process uh, continue. So for all of us as believers, there's a sense in which we need to keep moving, keep growing, keep going. Don't get stuck. Uh, don't lose momentum. Don't be a spectator. I don't know if you enjoy track and field. Um, one of the events I really love is the 1600 meter relay. Four runners, one lap, it's a full sprint, and you know, pass the baton to the next runner, and I, I just love that event. When I was in high school, let me tell you a story about two 1600 meter races uh, that I experienced. In one of them, I was watching, and the uh, second runner ran, it was in first place all the way around, gave the baton to the third runner, who then did the turn, and on the back stretch, slowed to a walk, and then sat down in the infield. True story. Everyone ran over there thinking he was hurt or injured. What's, what's wrong? What's going on? This is what he said. I just didn't want to run anymore. He actually stopped the race at the consequence of his whole team. He just didn't want to run anymore. Unbelievable. Sadly, with Christians, it can be the same way because we got the baton from somebody. Somebody poured into us, saved. God used them to save us, got us into the work. And then we at times can just go sit down. And we're not going to give that baton to anybody else. It's a, sad, it's a sad reality. But contrast that race with another one I saw. And we had this, this guy on our track team named Bill. We called him Wild Bill. And he was a sub-50, uh, 400, um, actually high 40s. He was a great runner. And during this one race, uh, I can't remember where he was. He might have been last. I can't remember exactly. But I, I remember when he took off around that first curve, he like uh, started to limp, almost like he pulled a muscle. But then he regathered his composure and his stride and just ripped it all the way around, ran a sub-50, and we, run, we, we won the relay race. But when he finished the race, he collapsed into the infield. We all went running over there to see how he was doing, what was going on. He ripped his shoe off, and there in his foot was a nail. He had stepped on a nail on the first curve, and it lodged into his shoe and foot, and he ran the whole race. And I'm like, man, that illustration stays with me because I want that to be true of me and true of you in our Christian lives. As we go through hard times, we step on things and get you know, attacked and whatnot. But to continue to run and to go all the way and to finish with Jesus, that's part of what we're talking about. We talk about multiply. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to give three reasons why it's so important and then three deep convictions. So first of all, multiply three reasons. And the first is because it's better than addition. Multiplication is better than addition, right? Like adding people to the family of God and, and to the church is great. That's awesome. But I think you'd agree multiplication is even better because that's addition on a massive scale. That's addition all over the place. That's a lot of people doing a lot of addition and it doesn't stop. So 10 plus 10 equals 20, right? But 10 times 10 equals 100, right? Or 100 plus 100 equals 200, but 100 times 100 equals 10,000. So there's a sense in which multiplication is even better uh, for the glory that God uh, deserves. So when it comes to the church, the body of Christ, I love that uh, analogy about us because bodies are made up of cells, and how, is it, how does a body get bigger and stronger? Well, cells, they reproduce and multiply. So in a sense, the larger, as we get larger, it's because on the smaller level, we reproduce and multiply. And I think that's what uh, Jesus is getting at when he says that we should be a reproducing, multiplying uh, group of Christians and church. Now, the second reason is because it gets people in the game. 
So whenever it comes to learning something like for real, a trade, an instrument, a sport, a, a profession, you got to get people in. You got to get them into the work. Like you only learn so much in a classroom, right? Or on the sideline watching. You have to uh, do it to learn, right? So, so I believe this applies to our Christian lives and we can wrongly portray that the way that Christians really grow up best is just sitting, hearing sermons, nothing wrong with that. But the greatest way to grow and to change is to get involved and actually do it. So I always want to err on the side of getting people into the work earlier rather than later. And this is how it starts for every disciple. I mean, for the, I mean, most disciples start because most Christians start out in serving because somebody took a chance on them and invited them or, um, you know, brought them with them. I mean, I think about my story. My story is just simply people over the course of my life that asked me, that, uh, again, took a chance uh, on me and and gave uh, gave the ministry away uh, to me. So we want to be people that do the same thing that we're that we're bringing people along with us, and we're uh, not going alone. I'll talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. What I've noticed is there's some organizations that do this way better than the church, and, and not perfectly, but but like the military. Or, or like uh, high-level sports, pros, colleges, um, or, or like some corporate culture. It's, it's an environment of movement. It's an environment of next man up because there's, there's promoting. And again, it's not perfect, but, but, it, but, it, but it's interesting because there's an expectation. There's even an enthusiasm for this movement and this growth and this process to take place. But then what happens so often in the church is we view the church as more of a destination. It's almost a place where we just go and stop rather than, no, no, we're very much in process and we want to get people uh, enlisted and uh, working and uh, a pipeline of new leaders because this is about uh, sp uh, growth into spiritual uh, parenting. Number three, third main reason is to expand the kingdom or to make room for more. So the kingdom of God advances one life at a time, one group at a time one new campus at a time, because we have been called to do that. We've been called to make disciples. The idea is to multiply. And so, the, so if you think about it, nothing exists for itself. I don't exist for myself. This church doesn't exist for itself. None of the campuses of River Valley. We all exist, not just for that particular campus, but to reproduce another group or another campus or when it comes to the individual another disciple it's pretty simple that, that, that it always is going somewhere to multiply something because that's what healthy cells do including of course the body of Christ so to expand the kingdom because Jesus said in John 6 uh, 10 16 I have other sheep that I must bring in so that's the idea that we're always looking. The church is that one organization that really exists for those who aren't here. And, and so who can we be uh, bringing in? And if you think about it, this, this is your story and mine. Like if you're a believer, somebody brought you in. Like, like somebody reached out uh, to you. Now our vision statement uh, that I'm so excited about is that we're gonna be covering Southern Oregon with relevant gospel-centered churches. So, uh, super exciting. And we have no idea exactly where the Lord's taken all this, but we know that he has given us this calling to, uh, yeah, be a strong campus wherever we are, downtown, Redwood, Murphy, you know, wherever, but to start new, like Sunny Valley, and then wherever else God has us go, because it's an opportunity to expand that kingdom, to make room for more. See, when a new church starts, 
Room is created for people that aren't in church, that aren't being reached, or at least not being reached by, by that kind of a church, what River Valley is able to do or how, what God does uh, through us. Same thing, let's say, for example, a new life group. When a new life group is started, what you do is you make room for more. The most successful way to get people connected in a new group is always a, a new group, okay? Um, not just any group. So when you step out and make that decision, it's expanding the kingdom and it's making room uh, for more people. So those are the three reasons. Let me quickly talk about three core convictions. Why is this like so at, at the passion core of our being? Well, the first reason is because really the goal, our goal is spiritual parenting. So again, like I talked about a few minutes ago, that, that, that anybody can become a spiritual parent and should. Like that's not really optional. As a Christian, we, we are, we may not, we're not all gonna have the same ministry or, how, or be pastor or even like life group leader or whatever, but we all should be growing to be somebody who helps the younger in their faith, that watches out, that protects. You know, the things that, that parents do. They love, they nurture, they help clean up messes right? They uh, provide, they help the younger become uh, more responsible adults and grow uh, into adulthood. They teach, they sacrifice. And, and so uh, what our heart is, is to help people along with ourselves, keep moving in that process towards being a spiritual parent. And, and like I said a few minutes ago, it's so easy to be about the destination. In fact, most churches are just a destination. Come to church, you know, get your church in, and that's not wrong, okay, it's not bad. But it's not really the true definition of church. A better definition of church is participation, maturation, and multiplication. That we're actually growing and something's happening in our lives. And so spiritual parents just work with God to do that same thing in other Christians that they're trying to see happen in their own lives as well. See, I mean, it's just like, it, it's just like a, a home here, maybe your home or another home. And, and imagine if a parent said, well, I'm training up my child so that they can stay here for the rest of their lives and, um, and basically uh, serve me and live, and live, and live in this house because I, I really don't want my child to leave. Well, I mean, like, that's not the goal. Like, I know that, that needs to happen at times and seasons and whatever, and different people launch out at different, you know, times. But, I mean, that's not the whole, like, what kind of goal is that? Like, like the house that our kids grew up in is not the final destination. Like, there's things that God has for them. In a spiritual context, I guess, I'm, a, I'm appealing to the same uh, reality, the same uh, mindset, um, that our enthusiasm and our expectation is to help people keep moving in the process of spiritual growth. Don't stay stuck. Don't get stalled out. Don't quit bringing people uh, along with you. Now, of course, this is painful whenever a kid leaves the house, goes to college, gets married, moves away. That's painful. That's not easy. But sometimes in the church, what happens is, you know, a group will go out and start a new campus. And, um, and sometimes it's easy to think, well, you know, this church is not the same anymore because these people, I don't see them and I don't see them downtown anymore. I don't see them. And, and we forget that the reason for that is because they're actually starting something brand new and it's super exciting. And so we gotta keep that core vision central it's not about us and like who isn't at our particular campus anymore or in our life group anymore because the whole goal is not that people stay there forever, but that there's a time when God wants to move them on to actually become spiritual parents and do that work that someone's been doing in their lives for so long. So we're just talking about a greater expectation and enthusiasm for the kind of discipleship that Jesus is talking about here. Not destination, but participation and multiplication. Here's a second conviction. Um, we bring others along with us. So 
what, one of the things I notice is it's so easy to just do things alone. Come to church alone or with your spouse. Um, come to group alone. Uh, do your ministry, your serving alone. And those aren't bad things. But what multiply means is that we're learning to bring people with us in the process. In other words, this doesn't have to be complicated. This whole multiplication could be very, very easy. Again, it's my story. People just brought me along. I started hanging out. It's been said that discipleship is more caught than taught just by being there. This is how most people get started. Um, really cool story of a guy named William Tennant, and he was a pastor in early America. Uh, he was a boring preacher. He was so boring, his church tried to fire him a number of times, but it was led by elders, so they couldn't do it. And uh, so what Tennant did as he continued to serve in this church is he saw these five boys, and they were kind of rambunctious, and they were uneducated, and they're always kind of hanging around the church and the community. And so he decided he was going to pour into these boys and train them, even teach them, as he built this log cabin behind the church. And that was a little school that he created for these five guys. And poured into them, taught them to read, to write, taught them about Jesus, the word, we don't know exactly everything he taught, but what we know about Tenet is that these five guys went out. When they grew up, they went out, and they became pastors, church leaders, missionaries in early America. They were part of the first great awakening. And uh, this little log cabin, uh, people made fun of Tenet. They called it Log Cabin College. They were making fun of him for what he was doing with these five boys. Well, when these five guys went out, they started all these churches, and at each one, they built a little log cabin behind their church, and they did the same thing for the, uh, the young people there in their community and taught them. Tenet's log cabin would come to be known as Princeton University. 67 of the other log cabins became universities and colleges all throughout early America, okay? And they were Bible uh, colleges and trained people up to be missionaries, men and women, exciting times. Now, it's sad to say that most all of those schools have gone so liberal or woke that it's, it's just tragic this, you know, this day, but for years and years, God used these schools in such powerful ways because there was a boring preacher who invested his life in a few young guys, and they changed America. So bring people with you. Number three, we're convinced we believe God's preparing people. So ultimately what we're talking about is that um, this is impossible. Like we can't do this. This is God's work. And so what is vital is that we ask God, we ask God. In Matthew 9, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So I love, it's one of my favorite verses because I'm reminded, I just need to ask God. He already has the workers out there. He's already got them ready. I just have to ask God. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God has put people already in the body to serve. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And then last, Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you guys see the theme there. It's all God. Like it's God who saves people. It's God who grows people. It's God who puts people into ministry. No, we don't do nothing. God wants us to work with him in that. But the main thing we need to do is ask God. Just ask God to save people. Ask God who you can invite. Ask God for more workers, and because he has them. We just need to believe that. I think we sometimes think, oh, there's nobody out there. No, they're there. We just have to believe God, and we need to ask God. And then number two, 
We need to ask them. We need to ask people. This is pretty simple. This was Jesus' strategy. Jesus didn't put together a serving brochure <laughs> or, you know, an announcement. Nothing wrong with those. But Jesus just asked people. Sometimes he didn't even ask. He says, follow me. Right? So there's this sense in which uh, face-to-face, making the ask, and inviting people to Jesus, to church, to help you serve, whatever it might be. Multiplying disciples. And don't miss this, and I, I, wanna, I wanna have us focus on this as we wrap up. We believe, I'm gonna say it again, time is short and lives are at stake. So we are urgently multiplying disciples. And, and I love how Paul, he hits on this a couple of times in his letters. One example is in Romans chapter 13, where he says, love one another, and this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. You know what I think about there as I read that verse? I think about a football game and the clock's ticking, it's winding down. We love those moments, especially when our team is coming down for that, you know, go ahead, final score. And, you know, the, the, the clock's running out. Uh, they're taking every second uh, seriously, we call that like the, you know, two-minute offense or hurry-up offense or tempo, different ways of talking about it where the quarterback will spike the ball to stop the clock, the, the, the runner will run out of bounds to stop the clock, they'll use their timeouts very strategically. It's really an exciting time in a football game, especially, you know, to see that happen at the very end and to see how the clock management's going to go and if your team indeed will uh, actually be able to win, kick the field goal, score the touchdown. We also know how frustrating it is, especially if it's your team, when there's poor clock management, right? Lackadaisical, just kind of uh, no urgency, poor clock management, you know. Uh, and, and it's just so frustrating, especially if it's at like the pro or the college level. It's like they should know better. They should know that the clock is ticking. They should know that when it goes down to zero, that's it game over, right? And, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, I hear, not the literal voice, but I hear Coach Paul, I hear Coach Jesus saying, Mark, the clock's ticking. Mark, time is running out. Life is short. I look at our culture, I look at the, our world. I'm not doom and gloom by any means, but, like, it looks like the end times. It looks like Jesus is going to be coming back soon. All the indicators are there. But you guys, even if that's not true, time is still short for us, right? The clock's ticking for me. Like, like some of us, we don't, we don't need a prophet to tell us that the end is near. We look in a mirror, right? <laughs> like we, we can see the, the, it's, life is short and we're not even guaranteed the rest of today or even the next minute. And so all that to say that these are the days to take seriously the last seconds, the last minutes, the last week, whatever, the last years of our life, and to make a difference with those years, make a difference with those days, with those seconds, with those minutes, that we do bring people with us, that we are trying to grow further along in our own uh, process towards spiritual parenting, to pour our lives uh, into others. Time is short for all of us, and I hope you'll join me. Uh, I pray uh, that you join me in that passion for Jesus and additional passion for others to come along with you. And so let's pray. So God, we thank you uh, that you have asked us to be in your work and to serve you. And, and, and God, that you have commanded that we are about multiplying, making disciples who will make disciples. And we uh, beg you for help because we can't do that on our own. We can't do that with our children. You know, we can't do that with uh, those that we work with or those that we're in life group with or those in our ministry. So only you uh, can do that by saving them, by changing them, by getting them involved in the work. But you can use us to try to bring them along and to ask them and to give uh, things to them to do. Uh, all these things we've learned today about the importance of multiplying the reasons for it and the convictions that we have about it. So God, we say continue please to use us, make a difference in our lives and in our church, we pray. 
and in our community, of course, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for spending today with us. Uh, Really encouraged by Mark's teaching and this idea that there is a sense of urgency when it comes to multiplying disciples, that we would be those people who would go out to to find those around us that we can be walking with and we've been taking along with us as we are on this journey for Christ as well. So uh, with that, we we pray you have a great week. Reach out to us if we could be praying for you and with you. Uh, Go through our church app, go to that Connect uh, space the tab on our our website or our app and let us know how we can be in your life as you are are part of this uh, church we have here at River Valley. Thanks again. Have a great week. See you next time.